Hello. I'm Eduardo Villaro, the Artistic Director and CEO of Bally Hispanico. Welcome to Choreographers and Cocktails. And with me is the fabulous Laura Diffendurfer. Hi. Can you Hi, hear me? Hi, Eduardo. How are you? I can hear you. Can you hear I'm me? I'm good. How are you? Yes, I can hear you. Um, Laura is the host of Still Spinning, which is a podcast brought to you by the Joyce Theater. And we are so, I am so grateful that Laura is here with us. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to you, Laura, because, uh, you know, I can't give myself my own questions, but I'm so thrilled you're here with us. I'm so thrilled to be here. And yes, the tables are turning on you. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm happy to be the one to do it. Um, Eduardo, it was just so lovely to see that piece again. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of us are moving a little bit less than we are used to. And just the pleasure of seeing the moving body, you know, arranged in such a beautiful motion is so moving. So thank you first for that. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I um, um, I'm sorry, I, I, it, it, it was, I was watching and I, I got a little bit emotional because there are some dancers that are not with, with me in the company, they've moved on. This was 2011 and um, they were just such wonderful human beings um, as all of our dancers are. So it was wonderful to see that and it was wonderful to see connection as you say, you know, to see human beings, um, communing and touching and, and our art form on stage. Um, it was powerful for me. Yeah. And um, actually on that note, so it, this piece features um, the music of the amazing Celia Cruz, um, the queen, queen of salsa, Cuban American, yes. amazing uh, artist. And um, yeah, I mean, there's just so much sort of pleasure and pain together in that music, which um, really moves me in this moment. Um, but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, who the artist Celia Cruz is to you. Well, Celia Cruz to me was that um, thread of connection. Um, when we immigrated here to um, the country, uh, you know, my parents had her albums. So in the living room next to the, um, you know, those old fashioned full set television phonograph. I, I know this is a thing of the past, but were stacks of these albums and a lot of them were her. And so my parents would put them on and, and the joy of them coming together and dancing and reliving their childhood and kind of connecting back was a, a, a thread for me to connect to um, uh, 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 my homeland that I really just began to know be before I left. So yeah, her music you, is, is something yeah, very yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah. And so I think one of my last point is that, you know, uh, that music stayed with me um, for a very long time. And um, I think it stayed with many people. One of the things that why I chose Celia is that she is kind of the connector of all Latin American countries. Everywhere you go in Latin America, everyone loves Celia. When totally. she passed, yeah, when she passed, it was like a royalty passing. Um, so it, it was, a, a, it, it, she was a very powerful person, certainly for many people. Yeah. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the title of the work? So azúcar, yeah, azúcar means sugar in Spanish, sugar. Um, yeah. and you know it. It in in Cuba, I was it, it. She used it um, as a kind of an uh, interjection, right? Azúcar, you know, when right. she sang, and you know, it, the the thing about Cuba and Cubans and sugar, there's such a, you know, yeah. sugar is a life was a lifeblood for so many years doing colonization. Um, and uh, gave us so much baggage, but yet gave us so much um, with the intermingling of cultures. And yeah. so it, it's a powerful word um, when you're from Cuba. Do you think it's also like a word of hope because like sugar was like gonna get you through the revolution um, in Cuba? 
Yeah, I, I, like I the think, production of sugar. I I don't think it was that so much. It's it's um, I I think it's it's a hope for her. It was a hope to come back home. I I would agree with that mm -hmm. hope. You know, she she you know one of the things many people do know and some people don't is that she really wanted to go back home at some point after she made it so big but the government would not allow her to return they wouldn't let her i didn't know that yeah and it was big it was it was big news and um you know it it hurt her um yeah. because uh it was so painful that she couldn't go back she loved her country um yeah. so it was she was a um a quite a political prisoner in a way, um, yeah. uh, both here and there. Yeah. Um, and well, you're kind of, you've kind of already shared, but is there anything else about her music that um, one that drove you to set dance to it? Um, I, I think, you know, for, for me as, as a, um, an artist who is, um, multiracial uh, or his background is multiracial her music captures that essence of cuba there's this strong strong powerful afro um cuban um in there but there's this the way she dressed this this elegance there's this you know magnificent that you know at, at that time it, you know colonization what it was for people of color was i i needed to get into the big house right i i, I wanted to emulate that so yeah. so there was a lot of that in her pageantry as well but in it she celebrated the afro-cuban culture and that was very important to me um because i i have anson street you know my my family so we are very mixed and so there was something there for me in that music that spoke to all of that. And I think in the piece, yeah. I tried to touch upon that in many different ways. Um, and, and in many ways, it, I, I tried to really um, give a feeling of what it is to leave some uh, your homeland. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? What the, the moments in the piece that, um, that you were doing that? Yeah, well, one of the things that I remember, you know, was boarding the plane, waiting on line mm -hmm. yeah. to get on a plane. That's my first, my first memory of leaving for Cuba. But the whole thing of a line, a cola, right? <laughs> uh, a, a cola is, is so prevalent in Cuba because yeah. when uh, the government took over, it was all about, um, it was all about waiting in line for food, waiting in line oh. for goods. And so yeah. I wanted to, to take that because waiting in line becomes a, um, an immigrant experience. You're either waiting in line on one side of, uh, of where you left or when you come back, you're always waiting. And that waiting and that anticipation is a lot of what I wanted to capture mm -hmm. with the dancers. Yeah, beautiful. Um, can you talk a little bit about the text that's in, in the piece? Where is it from? So um, I, I, I did a lot of research in, um, in uh, radio because at that time, you know, it, radio was big. Right. And so you got your information and also this idea about the information you received here and the information that you received in Cuba. Yeah, because the radio is limited, right? Correct, so there was no communication. So it was interesting to hear, to get something that reflected who Cubans were from a from an American vantage point at that time, I was it was just curious to me because it's about the gays, right? Which yeah. we still yeah. still deal with, right? right? And so I wanted to capture some of that um, with the reality of who these people were, um, and this and this notion of someone else telling you, look at the history of these people, and these people yeah. not telling you themselves their history, right? Yeah, kind of like an anthropologist talking about a culture they don't quite understand. Right, exactly, exactly. And then there was that, you know, radio waves, that whole thing about trying to connect, right? You're, you're searching mm. on a radio to yeah. connect. That was very, uh, I wanted to bring that because that's what we try to do. And, you know, I always experience in my family the, the effort, the, 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 the need to connect. And so 
that I used the radio and that kind of trying to find that radio station uh, sound as as that aspect. Yeah, can you tell me more about the need to connect for you? Ah, oh, that's so good. You know, you're so good. Um, <laughs> I, I think that that's that's my that is my um, kind of reason of of being an artist, reason of of doing what I do, right? You come into this country and you you want to connect and you have connected, but there's such a longing, you know, the trauma of, of yeah. immigration or migration um, leaves scars on you, all yes. over you. And a lot of it is that, do I fit in? And do I really connect? Um, and when I talk to my colleagues, whether they're actually my generation or a generation younger or two, um, uh, Michelle Manzanales is one, she's a choreographer that we work with. And so we talk about that kind of how you're removed and you're like this third yeah. space almost. And so I yeah. think that it's, a, it's an important thing um, that, uh, that, that, we, that, that we need to connect. I certainly need to. And so hence the, the work that I do. So it, it kind of bleeds into everything I do. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of does lead me into um, the next question that I have, which is, I know that you have worked with a number of artists um, to help them develop their craft and um, to really delve into their own um, personal history and ethnicity. And I was wondering if that was something that came naturally to you to do right away, or was it a process for you to look back on your own heritage? Um, well, you know, looking back for my own heritage has been a long process. So I won't give years or dates or how old I am. Um, but what I wanted to do with uh, the dancers, and they were really creative and really helpful to me. I also wanted to find where they were at in their state, wherever they came from. And what were all these aspects we talked about? What, were, what was that in their lives? And mm. that's where we started from. We started from their experience and we developed um, movement vocabulary from that. And then I was able to put it throughout the, the work um, and continue and develop it further. But it was important to me because sometimes when you're creating a work um, and you're trying to do something that's culturally uh, sensitive yep. or culturally connected, you know, folks just don't jump into the bandwagon. You know, you can, you can do all you want with the movement, but there's something that I, I needed to feel um, in, internally for them and I wanted them to have. And so we, we did a lot of sharing. We did a lot of movement going back and forth. I mean, the, the work had, a, had, had quite ups and downs all over the place. And then all of a sudden it just started gelling. You know, there's that moment where it, I didn't know where it was going um, because I was allowing so many people's own experience in with movement that right. um, I needed to then start directing it, right? Um, and it's not a, a narrative of Celia Cruz. For me, the work is an experience of how her music um, affected people and how her, the, the songs really talked about this longing in yeah. every which way, whether it was, there's a song about the moon, um, there, there's a song about um, many different uh, ways of uh, good, saying good night, um, good night, my mm. love, in one of the duets. Um, and so, so it was important for me to have their, their voice in the work. Sorry, I'm talking too much now. No, that's not too much. And actually, that's so interesting. I'm really glad you said that. The, the, I just want to highlight what you said about um, that sort of, I don't know if I'm interpreting you correctly, but what I'm hearing is that sometimes if you're doing a culturally specific piece, it's easy to be sort of surface, like people will mm -hmm. accept that, but you really want to delve deeper and that is more complicated, but really right. like important work that. that yeah, I think it is, yeah, I think it is, it. you're absolutely right. Um, thank you for that, um, for coalescing that so, so nicely. Um, it, it is, it is important, you know, 
I came to this country when I was six. Some of these dancers that I worked with um, came at another age. I know some of them were from Latin America. Others who were American have a different experience. Somehow or other, there's, there's a connectivity, even though we're from so different places. And so how do you find that? I think that is a, um, that's an interesting, what for me, it was an interesting study. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you've talked a little bit about this, but is there anything else that you remember about the creation of the work in that period that stands out for you? Yes. 2000, yeah, you know, 2011, I was in the company. I had um, uh, taken the reins of the company in the end of two, uh, August 2009, and it was my first work. I was very excited, you know. Oh. Yeah, it was my first work for the company. I had done quite a few works in Chicago with Luna Negra Dance Theater. Yeah. So um, this was very exciting for me. Um, and I was thrilled. And I, I think that the, you know, the experience really changed me. And, and that's why while I was watching it today, I, was, I got really emotional. I was like, oh my God, that was such a time, you know? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a different person now. And so that's one of the mm -hmm. things about seeing art, art right, develop. It develops not only for the, for the artist, it develops yeah. for the audience yeah. as well. And when you go yeah. back to it, it brings you back and then it takes you somewhere else. Um, and so that's yeah. why I'm such a, a big fan of, so you saw Swan Lake, see it 500 other times. So you saw this, see it, you know, so you saw, sorry, I use Swan Lake, uh, a ballet reference, but I mean any work. Um, so you come back to it, you inhabit it, and then you you, you frame your, your yourself and the way the art, what the artist was trying to uh, work on. Oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> are you able to share a little bit about how you feel different now? Yeah, I, um, sorry, there's a train. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> uh, I, I feel different. Um, I, I certainly feel my, 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 uh, I don't want to say age mm. because I, I feel still very much, a ch there's an inner child in me that's always very um, effervescent uh, and I, I love life <laughs> in so many different ways. But there is a, a kind of settling because it's been, first of all, with my career, it's been 10, a decade that I've been at the helm of Ballet Hispanico. And so uh, everything is very different in my approach um and then you know i i have a, a son so that also affected i mean when i moved here he was just one so i've i've learned uh a lot so it changes you and i feel a little bit more solid oh cool we have a bunch of questions from the audience yeah we do um yeah let's go ahead and turn to some you audience do that? questions yeah um do you want me to pick them or do you want to pick yes, them? Yes, yes, please, please, would you? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. We have a, what, what is your favorite uh, section of the piece? Do you have one? And also what memories do you have of the process, which you kind of already answered, but if you, if you have a specific section to speak on, that would be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think my favorite section, um, I, all of them are, are, are my favorite section, but um, the, the soloist, Jessica Wyatt, was such an interesting dancer because she was so classically trained. And her and I worked together and she became a contemporary dancer. And yet even, even though she was classically trained, she knew how to dance salsa like nobody's business. She knew the, the Afro-Caribbean um, uh, feel. And it's so beautiful because you know, it, it, to me, she's the epitome of what I think Ballet Hispanico, a Ballet Hispanico dancer is. The, 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 able to show you line, but with the weight of, of the Afro influence and, you know, our Latin um, uh, movement quality. So, yeah. so working with her on that 
And the idea of Celia was one of those moments that I will cherish forever. Amazing. Um, yeah, she, she's about to have a, a, her first baby. Um, oh. And if you're looking, Jess, if you're watching, congratulations, we miss you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have a question. How has the immigrant experience uh, stayed the same and how has it changed? Whoa, that's a loaded question. That's a big one. That's a big one. Um, I, uh, <laughs> wow, um, oh, let's go, let's, let's get in. That on? <laughs> yeah, let's take it on. Okay. I think the, the immigrant experience um, hasn't changed much. I yeah. think we, we are, we continue to be terrified by the other. And yet yeah. the other is what's made this country great. I am, everybody from, from the Italians and the Irish and everyone who came, the Jewish, um, to to all the the the, the I, I mean, our our even our, our African American who were slaves here were immigrants. They were brought here, um, enslaved, and so we have this um, interesting uh, conundrum that this country is made by people who came from other somewhere other, and still we have to fight the unimaginable. Uh, position of people who think this is mine now you don't belong here um, so it is something that that I certainly yeah. deal with on a constant basis so I has it changed uh, you can come in and go maybe a lot easier because there are planes trains and automobiles from you know earlier on you had to take a boat to get in here in the turn of the century but um has the structure of it changed? It's gotten worse now, of course. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking maybe it's actually worse. It's gotten worse now because uh, I don't know if it's gotten worse. I, I just think it, look, I, I'm, I, I, I have a lot of friends and people who go through the immigration thing. It's, it continues to boggle me why we can't get a hold of this. Um, because again, I'll just say it, immigrants make this country great. Um, Unintended. Yeah. <laughs> Someone said, how old were you when you came to the US? But you were eight, you said that, right? I was uh, six, actually. Oh, six, okay. Yeah. Um, has Asuka unearthed new meanings for you? What did you notice? Uh, did you notice things now that you might not have before? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I, I think that I would approach it different now because Ooh. yes, uh, I, I would the the same approach with the dancers, but I I would approach the content just a little different because I'd want it to reflect what's going on now. Mm. So so I, I think it it would have uh, an essence of that. So I would I would kind of look at how um, how I work. You know, also the the dancers change. Um, it's been 10 years that I've been molding dancers and developing kind of, um, like I said, a, a certain type of dancer that I like for the aesthetic of the company. And this company that I have right now is, you know, top of the top. And I, I just, I love them. They are um, artists from all, all over the place, from all over Latin America, from all over the United States. Um, they're a beautiful mixture of people. Um, and so I would, uh, while I was watching, I was like, oh God, I got to do this piece again for this company and then, and then work on changing those things. And I think that that's what I, I'm certainly myself as a choreographer, I won't speak for anyone else. I love to go back and fidget. Yeah. I think people usually say they're just never done with a piece, you know, it could just yeah. like keep going and going. Although I know there are people that don't like to look back. Um, yeah, and especially since the piece you were, you know, it sounds like for the first time working a lot more with the dancers and their personal experiences, you could draw that in. Um, yeah, yeah, it would be great. I do want to answer this one. Oh, great. This one from uh, one of the dancers. It's so sweet uh, because uh, we took this piece to Cuba back in 2014. Yes. And I'll tell you a story. 
we we did i'll tell you a few stories that were great we did uh, maybe not we did a um a performance and uh i will never forget this that that the audience afterwards so you was were, a little you, this is when you returned to cuba oh, for so i returned to cuba yes i i finally returned to cuba in 2014 in 2014 and once the the we, we finished the piece the audience was a little quiet and then this roar started right and i'll never forget that at the end of the the evening someone uh, a cuban uh, diplomat came to me and's like you know what you brought celia back to cuba <gasps> and i was oh, and no. and he's like you have to realize that she her music is not allowed to be played here Still. Is it not allowed? Well, I now they I, I guess they it is. But even when I was coming back, I, the director there uh, of the the ballet festival said, you know, this might be a little tricky because you have all Celia music, but let's go for it. We want to bring it. And that to me was so powerful in so many different ways that we were able to bring Celia back in in this way and and like really glorify her on a Cuban stage in a land that she wanted to return to. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And, um, and it looks like, do you think we have time for one more question or should we go ahead and come to sure, it? I think one more. Okay, well, on that note, um, I was wondering if you could tell us if there's anything about Celia's music in particular or this work that you feel like resonates in this, in this moment. Yeah, you know, I think like all great artists, their work will resonate forever. There are yep. connections. And, you know, even though people say, oh, this new generation doesn't connect to, there is so, the, the, the glory of technology, someone will use this music, it'll come back and it'll speak to someone. And I think that she is, uh, um, she is a, a her, such a strong character um, and she speaks to women, empowerment, beauty, you know, beauty that is not, that is other, brown beauty, black beauty. Um, so I think that, that this is another moment for Celia and I look forward to seeing more, hearing more of her music and doing this work again. It'll come back. Yeah. It really moved me um, sort of, I mentioned this in the beginning, but that sort of combination of pleasure, pleasure and pain, you know, it's sad, but it's just so joyful also, which is like, you know, very typical of music with an African influence. And um, yes. it just moved me so much. And it reminded me of something that I read a couple of months back that like when, when pain goes up, it, pain and, Pain and pleasure are not correlated. So when pain goes up, pleasure doesn't go down. They exist, you know, you can have pleasure yeah. and pain together, which um, sort of struck me in this moment, um, something that we, we need pleasure too. So thank you um, for sharing this work tonight. Um, and thank you for talking with me, Eduardo. Well, it was so wonderful having you with me. I mean, I'm usually on the other side and uh, um, you, I so am so grateful for you being with us. So yep. with that, we're going to end. And I want to um, everybody clap for Laura. She's amazing. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Um, stay with us. Next WEPA Wednesday, we have El Beso by Gustavo Ramirez Sanzano. It is such a fun piece. Please be with us. And I think we might have the choreographer with us for post question and answer. Follow, up, follow us on at Valley Hispanico. And adios, amigos. Bye, Laura. Bye. Thank Adios, you. Thank you for watching.